Hi there and welcome. Now it's time for America's favorite podcast. Leave your mark with your host, Vince Cortez. This is Leave Your Mark. I am Vince Cortez, and today's guest is Stanley George Savrinsky, Stan Savrin. Stan is from Cleveland, Ohio, and a member of the Mayfield High School Hall of Fame. At Mayfield, he was a participant in baseball, basketball, track, football, and a band member playing the sax and clarinet. He then went to Miami of Ohio, where he graduated and began his broadcasting career. And upon graduation, his career took root when his first play-by-play -play assignment was issued from the World Football League in the 74-75 season. Stan, thank you for being here today. I'm very excited to talk to you. Vince, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I have watched you since my childhood, looking at these numbers here. And, you know, you and Myron Cope were on the broadcast there when the Steelers were etching their mark in the NFL Eccles. And so I was very excited to get you on the show here today. So what I'd like to do is start off and give us a little background about your life in Mayfield, Ohio, and your, your childhood years and growing up. I was born in Cleveland, February 25th, 1947. Maybe it was 1847. I don't know, feeling old, but I was in the city of Cleveland. And when I was nine, we moved out to a suburb called Mayfield Heights. My father initially drove a bread truck. He delivered bread to, uh, you know, grocery stores and that kind of thing. Um, and he eventually got into the home improvements business and ultimately owned his own company. Uh, that, that sounds a lot better than it was, uh, Vince. He was the only employee. Uh, it wasn't like he had this big company. Um, my mother worked at a number of jobs, but she ended up working uh, in the medical field um, for doctors, medical records, those kinds of things. And of course, uh, in those days, they were all kept by paper, you know, on files. There were no computers. Um, and she was one of the rare women from that era who worked full time. Uh, she had to, uh, to support, help support the family, uh, along with my dad. Um, I am the eldest of four uh, children. I have three sisters, uh, all of them younger than I am. Um, everybody's younger than I am. Um, uh, the, the next oldest to me uh, lives in Los Angeles. Um, she um, uh, did a number of things. She was a computer programmer, a school teacher, speaks five languages fluently, um, my middle sister is a very prominent attorney in Washington, D.C. Um, she is an executive with the D.C. Bar Association, um, and she's about to turn 69. And my youngest sister, who was born when I was just 17, or I was 17, um, also lives in Los Angeles. She's a school teacher, has been for a number of years. Um, childhood, I would describe our family as being sort of a level below middle class, um, just based on the income. Um, they both work, I mean, diligently. The thing I'm most proud of, Vince, is my work ethic. Um, I've never not worked hard a day in my life. And I learned that from my parents who did that and taught me the value of that. Um, but we didn't know that we didn't have any money. We just, you know, you know what you know. And yeah. you know, so that was that. And um uh, you know, fairly uneventful. I was always involved uh, in athletics because uh, my father was really into it. Uh, my mother may have been the most knowledgeable, and I don't mean this to be condescending, but she was, in my view, the most knowledgeable female sports fan I've ever known. She really knew what she was talking about. In fact, my parents' first date was to a Cleveland Indians baseball oh, wow. game. Yeah, but for real. When you said that, that was funny because it struck a nerve. My mom, I believe, was the bigger sports fan as well in my house. And my dad was a coach. And uh, she often, in our youth, referred to sitting in front of the radio listening to Cleveland Indian games with her father. So yep. uh, she's from Youngstown, Ohio. So that I totally relate where you're coming from there. Now, um, you participated in the sports in, uh, in high school and the track, baseball, and ball, and football. So uh, was that where the interest lied when you got into broadcasting because of the sports background? Well, I mean, I think 
you know, that had a lot to do with it. I mean, like every other kid, I played Little League, um, uh, you know, Pony League, uh, Colt League. I was good enough to play on a traveling team that traveled around the city of Cleveland to play. I was by far from being the best player on the team, but we had a pretty good team. Um, people ask me how long, especially people in college or high school, um, whom I mentor or they come and they want advice if they should get into the field. And one of the questions I often get is how long have you prepared for your job? And I would say, oh, about 65 years. Um, <laughs> because uh, since I was a little kid, that was my main interest. It's not my only interest. And my interests have expanded uh, beyond sports as I've gotten older. But it was always the biggest thing for me. Just a quick story. When I was in elementary school, I guess fourth, fifth grade, um, they put a moratorium on me checking out sports books in the school library. Um, the principal called home and said, we got to get him interested in something else. So for the longest time, uh, I wasn't allowed to check out sports-related books in the library. So you see where my head was at. Where, where, how old that, were you at that time? I would say fourth, fifth grade. Oh, wow. So you know, and, and, 19 and I, I years good, old. Yeah. I mean, I was a good student, uh, but I mean, you, you could see where this was going. Yeah. I was just always fascinated by it. Not only would I sit there and listen to Cleveland Indians baseball games, um, not that many were on TV back then, but I would actually keep score to every game and I would make my own score uh, scorecard. I mean, I would get, you know, notebook paper and draw the lines. So you'd have, you know, places to put the players in nine innings. And I'd sit there and listen and keep score. Uh, my well, father taught me how to right on there. Yep, keep right the book. There. And that's I the way. It. Yeah. And so and did, by, by chance, did you do that when you broadcasted later or was that being done for you in the booth? Well, I mean, I, I didn't, I haven't done that much baseball. Uh -huh. uh, I did. I, I have done some baseball, and when I did it, no, I kept it myself. Uh -huh. um, I, and, and if I did basketball, I kept my own scoreboard, scorebook, excuse me. Football, of course, is a different thing. I mean, I had a different way to make notes to myself, but that's, you know, you don't do a play-by-play, -play, um, you know, keeping score, if you will. Uh, so it was a natural progression for me. Yeah, uh, your interest was there. It was there. And then, of course, I began playing football in junior high in the eighth grade. Um, and um, that's the earliest they would let you play back then. Yeah. Uh, there was no such thing as Little League football, not in Cleveland. Yeah. So there was no such thing. But the first organized activity in school was football in the eighth grade. Um, and I, of course, played all the way through my senior year. Um, I played um, two years of high school baseball. Um, I only played one year of basketball that was my i played as a freshman but i played as a sophomore um but in my sophomore football season um i tore up my knee uh. and so that took away the rest of the basketball season that was from football and a good portion of my junior year in football well so you were in a different era of the operation as well that was yeah like a death sentence back in the day it was like it was. Oh, he's, he's done um, there was no there was no such thing as arthroscopic surgery. No. In fact, the guy who did the surgery on my knee, and it was a full-blown surgery. Um, I won't torture you with showing you the scar, but you know, <laughs> back in those days, it's a prominent scar. Uh, the guy who did the procedure was the team orthopedic surgeon for the Cleveland Browns. Um, but I came back to play, and so uh, the point is, is that, um, yeah, the, the die was cast, Vince, since uh -huh. I was a little kid, and I wanted to be involved. In fact, uh, when my knee wouldn't allow me to play basketball uh, i became the statistician for the basketball okay. team. okay i was still playing baseball and football as a participant and athlete but i i wanted to stay close to it and so yeah that's what i did well i want to touch on here so we're going to run through miami of ohio you graduate with a broadcasting degree you have some college experience as a broadcaster so you, you're ready to get your first job on air and you said that that was W-E-L-W in Willoughby, Ohio. Yeah. And the interesting backstory on this was you said that you lied to get the <laughs> job. What happened there? I didn't lie to get the job. I already had the job. <laughs> um, but the job um, I actually got, I, 
I got out of college in, I graduated in April of 1969. And I was the first member of my entire extended family to go to college. My parents were depression people. They didn't go. Nobody in the family went. People didn't do that. And then the war came, World War II. Uh, and so uh, it was a big deal. It was a bigger deal for them than it was. For, I was just glad to get out um, and make <laughs> it. But um, um, my mother was especially touched. Um, my dad was proud. Um, and and I graduated. And as soon as I graduated, I got a job at a small little station in Cleveland. And that usually was unheard of because I, I had broadcasting experience at the college level, but not as a professional. Although I had done some professional broadcasting my senior year at Miami. I worked for a station doing high school basketball games. Uh, I think I made 10 bucks a game, whatever it was. Didn't even pay for my gas to get there, but I was <laughs> thrilled to do it. Um, and I, I got this job at this little radio station in Cleveland. Um, and the week before I was supposed to start, I came down with mononucleosis. Oh, no. And I was, uh, yeah. And the guy couldn't wait for me, which I understood. And that led to weeks and months of unemployment. Uh, I was, you know, going to the post office, dropping off audition tapes to any place that I thought might be hiring. I was on a first name basis with the postal clerk there, um, you know, because I was dropping <laughs> so often. And I got rejection after rejection after rejection. Um, my mother had a cousin who was a rather prominent attorney in Cleveland. And he represented these three guys who worked at a major Cleveland radio station. It's now WTAM 1100, big station, 50,000 watts. And these three guys were executives there, but they were going on their own to buy a small radio station in suburban Cleveland. My mother's cousin, I guess my second cousin, um, was their attorney. And so my mother called him. I didn't ask her to, but she did. She was a pretty aggressive woman and said, can you help him? So they gave me a job as a salesman selling advertising. Uh, at the time, I had been working selling memberships to the Automobile Club. I was just trying to oh, do man. something, and it was embarrassing. There's my college diploma up on a wall, and here I am, this slug, recovering from mono, no job, college degree. So I, I took the job at less than half the pay that I was getting at the Automobile Club. It was 70 bucks a week. This is October of 1969. So you can say that again. So that that's like seven dollars yeah. a week. Okay, and and all the records you could eat. Oh. Um, <laughs> and he actually had you on a commission set up, you know, based on how many commercials you sold. But it was such that you you could never reach that. I mean, it was it was just you couldn't get there. Um, but I immediately quit the automobile club just to get a job. So and I had never sold anything in my life. My dad was a salesman, um, his company selling home improvements. Uh, I still don't know how he was able to do that, but he did. And I knew nothing about sales. <clears throat> so I'm out selling, and I'm at this place. Here's where the lying part comes in. I'm out selling to this place called, I'll never forget it, Daniels Brothers Fuel Oil Company in Willoughby, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland, about 30 miles out of downtown. And so I'm talking to this guy, and he's like a hard-bitten guy. He owns a fuel oil company, right? Um, you could just see him, you know, taking pipes and doing stuff. And I got an appointment with him, and I said, Mr. Daniels, we have this, and if you buy this many commercials for this amount of money, we'll play them then. He said, no, nope, not interested. No, nope, not interested. I'm grasping at straws. I, I barely made a sale. I'd been there over a month. I said, do you like sports? He said, oh, I love sports. He said, well, how'd you like to sponsor a five-minute daily sports show on WELW? He said, I'll buy that. So I, <laughs> I signed him to the contract, and I go back to the station, talk to the sales manager, and I said, Ray, I got, and they'd been trying to get this guy on the air for years. I said, Ray, I got Daniels Brothers. He said, oh, my God, you, you, we've been trying to get him for years. What'd you sell him? I said, a five-minute daily sports show at four o'clock every day. He said, we don't have a five minute sports cast at 5, 4 p.m. every day. I said, if you want their money, you do now. 
<laughs> and he said, well, who's going to do it? And I said, I'm going to do it. And that's how I actually got on, got on the air as a professional, quote, professional broadcaster. That's awesome. I true love story. it. True story. Absolutely true. Connect with us on LinkedIn. Be our friend on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You are listening to listening to Vince Cortez. We just want you to leave your mark. Now, how, the, uh, what I want to do is I want to jump here. So you're still in Ohio at this point. Yeah. And your first job in Pittsburgh is WWSW KQV Radio. So no, 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 no. It wasn't this, KQV this, Radio yet. Not yet. And actually, there were stops in between. After I left the little station in Willoughby, um, I went to a station in Lawton, Oklahoma, for a year and a half. If you don't know where that is, you're lucky. Um, it's that sounds like a triple-A baseball city. Uh, not even that. It would, <laughs> I mean, it was, the funny thing about Lawton is, it's in the southwest corner of the state. Um, and, of course, there's Tulsa and there's Oklahoma City. Lawton you've never heard of it, is the third biggest city in the state. And the reason it was is because Fort Sill Artillery Base is located there. And when I went out there in June of 70, um, if you were sent to Fort Sill, guess where your next stop was? Vietnam. Oh. And so there were 80,000 soldiers on the base. There were 20,000 people in the town. Um, so I got a job through a connection, through a connection, once again, selling advertising, but also on the air as a disc jockey and a sports announcer. And from there, um, I was there for over a year and a half. And then in October of 1972, I got a job in Columbus, Ohio, announcing Ohio State football. I take that back. Yeah, the Buckeyes. October of 1971, excuse me. Um, and I I, uh, I was 24. Uh, that was an amazing leap for me. But I had done Miami of Ohio football, basketball, and baseball. Um, uh, you know, I had done a lot of high school sports when I was in uh, Oklahoma. I mean, I had a pretty good resume for a guy only 24. But to get Ohio State, that's a little bit of a different story. I did that that's for two time. seasons. Yeah, it was big time. And it was a thrill. Being in the horseshoe at oh, that yeah. time, 86,000 people, the tuba would dot the I, people oh, going yeah. crazy. It was great. Um, I was there for two seasons. Then the radio station lost the rights to broadcast. So they had no more use for me. Um, that's when I ended up in Orlando, Florida in March of 1973. Now, after that stint, am I right? In 1974, you got the anchor job at WTE. Is that correct? No, uh, that, that was years later. I was in Orlando, um, 70, uh, March of 73 until December of 75. And I then got the job to come to Pittsburgh at what was then known as WWSWAM okay. and was owned by the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Okay. And I got the job. There used to be a publication... Vince, I don't even know if it exists anymore. It was called Broadcasting Magazine. And it was kind of a trade magazine. But in the back, they had a classified section. So if you were looking for a job, uh, if a station was looking for a performer, um, there was a, a classified thing in the back. Everything, however, was done to a blind box. Because if I'm, as I was, uh, I don't want my boss to know I'm looking for a new job. And if a radio station is looking for a replacement, they don't want to know that they're about to get rid of somebody. So... Yeah. Um, the magazine was located in D.C., so I saw the ad, and it said, Major Northeast Market looking for a sports director. Commentary, news reporting, blah, blah, blah. So I sent in an audition tape to D.C. Um, I had no, It didn't say where it was, it said the Northeast Market. I'll be honest with you, I never thought or considered Pittsburgh to be Northeast. You know, being from Cleveland, they're so close, I thought it was like sort of Mideast. Yeah, I thought yeah. this was going to be New York, Boston, Philly, um, D.C., you know, uh, you know, Providence, something like that. Yeah. Um, I heard back from the radio station um, in three days, and I knew they were interested. Um, and they contacted me, and they said, we'd like to fly you up for an audition. 
So I was thrilled to death. Um, they flew me up for the audition. I was here for two days. Um, our the station then was located at Allegheny Center. Um, and, and I'll never forget, um, I landed in Pittsburgh, you know, wearing Florida-type clothes. Mm. I mean, it was December. That's all I had, right? Mm -hmm. And, of course, it was freezing. And um, the cabbie picked me up, and I, I told him where I needed to go. And the funny thing, just to uh, digress for a minute, years later, and I don't remember what station I was at, I got a call on one of my talk shows, and he said, Stan, this is the cabbie that took you from the airport to the radio station for your job interview. And I, I was so touched. It was just, anyway, wow. they auditioned me. Um, a guy named Greg Benedetti had been there. He left 3 uh, WWSW. 3 WS was the FM station at that time. And Greg had gone to KDK to do weekend TV with Bill Curry. And they needed a replacement. And so I auditioned. Um, I was there. They took me out to dinner. The next afternoon, um, they hired me. Um, I was so excited. I'd always wanted to work in a major sports market. And I have to tell you this. So I get a cab and go back out to the airport to get my flight back to Orlando, turn in my notice and come back in two weeks, whatever it was. I get to the airport. And of course, this is 1975 now. And I want to call my parents. Well, you have to use a pay phone. <laughs> There's no cell phone. There's no Zoom call. Yeah, yeah. So I, I you know, I, and of course, like I did in college, I called Collect, so they'd have to pay for it. I, and I, I, so I dialed my home phone. My dad answers the phone. Collect call from... Uh, uh, and I said Stavransky, which is my full name. I've legally changed it since, but, um, I, and my dad said, I accept. And I said, dad, I got some news for you. Um, he said, what good news? I said, well, I think so. I said, I guess you got a new job. And he said, oh, that's so great. He said, where? I said, Pittsburgh. Dead silent at the end <laughs> of the phone. This is a guy who was born and raised in Cleveland. He was a Browns season ticket holder since they came into existence and the Browns Steelers rivalry. And then he said, he started to laugh. He said, I'm only kidding. He said, this is so great. You'll be closer to home. He brought my mother to the phone who immediately burst out crying. And so that's how I ended up in Pittsburgh. Uh, that that actually is the beginning of another story that you shared with me that I think makes this kind of interesting. That when you began broadcasting the Steeler games with Myron Cope, the Steeler fans did not like you broadcasting. They thought you were a spy from Cleveland. Yeah. This um, is so it, it, you got it from your dad first. Now you're getting it from your 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 fans. Yeah, uh, well, I, I don't know that I had any fans at that point. <laughs> um, I actually, I only did a couple of, uh, I did some Steeler broadcasts on radio. On two different occasions, Jack Fleming got ill, and they put me in the booth with Myron. So, I mean, I was, you know, doing talk shows and whatever, but I was not actually on the Steeler broadcast until I began doing the TV preseason games with Jack Ham. That's when I went to Channel 4 in 85. But when I got here in 76, um, I didn't get a talk show until um later that year it was may something like that and i convinced wwsw 970 which is, by the way the same same station i'm on now which shows you that in 45 years wow. my career's gone absolutely nowhere and I'm, <laughs> I'm at the same place where i started how, how poor is that well um, i mean you you got some uh, your western pennsylvania sports hall of fame you're the pittsburgh pirates wall of fame uh, I can understand now how you got in with the Post Gazette as a sports writer. That would have to have been thrilling, being the broadcast side first. Um, I give me a little story or background on when you and Myron Cope did the talk show, The Golden Era of Pittsburgh Sports. And uh, yeah, Bob what Smizek. was Myron like? Um, Bob Era, uh, Bob Smizek, who used to do you know reporting, but radio and TV columns. He called it the golden age of Pittsburgh sports talk um, because not only um, Myron had his show, um, I was at um, 970. Then I went to KQV. Um, 
And then when I left KQV and went to 1250 to go back to back with Myron, Sam Nover did a talk show on KQV, um, uh, opposite me, as a matter of fact. And Sam was a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. He passed away in December of uh, 2018. He was so kind to me and served as a mentor and really showed me the ropes in Pittsburgh. Um, initially, Channel 4, I was at KQV, and I was very happy there. Um, it was it's not even on the air anymore, but it was the all-news station, and uh, I was doing very well there. The guy who ran it and uh, was a part owner, his name was Bob Dickey. Um, best guy I've ever worked for. He's gone now, but wonderful man. Channel 4 tried to hire me, Vince. They wanted to add to their sports staff, which was Bill Hillgrove and John Steigerwald at the time. Cope, he just did commentaries. Um, so he wasn't like, you know, on the 6 and 11 o'clock news, generally. But they wanted to expand their sports staff. Keep in mind that the Pirates had just won the series. The Steelers had just won their fourth Super Bowl. Mm. And they felt like now was the time to strike. And they went after me and tried to hire me. We had wow. a lot of conversation. And I said, I'm flattered, but I'm not coming unless I get a radio talk show. And negotiations stopped. I said, that's the one ask I have. Wasn't about money, wasn't about anything. And I knew that at some point I needed to get into the TV. And they finally capitulated. And they did check with Myron first, if he minded, because we were competitors at that time. He was on at that time from 7 to 8. I was on from 6 to 7.30, so we overlapped. Mm -hmm. um, that changed because eventually they expanded Myron to 6 to 8, and I was on from 8 to 9 when I went to 12.50. But Myron said, okay. Um, he said, if it makes our station stronger, all the better. So when they finally capitulated, that's when I agreed to go to Channel 4. Um, however, I still had given my word to this guy, Bob Dickey, KQV, that I would not leave KQV until the first of the year. This is in August that we reached agreement. I said, but I... I I'm not going to renege on a promise I made to this wonderful man. So what I did was in the fall, I started working on TV, anchoring the weekends, still doing my daily talk show on KQV, working seven days a week, which I did often. And then January 1st of 1981, um, I started doing my talk show on uh, 1250 WTA radio back to back with Meyer. Um, Myron was always a little leery of me. Uh, I'll be upfront and honest. We did not have, we weren't friend, friends. We were friendly on a pers on a professional basis. Um, but, um, I, I, we just respected one another. I mean, he once said on the air, he said, you are a real professional. And that's all I wanted from him. Joy. Joy. Uh, <laughs> Double yoy. Double yoy. Um, but we were different people. We had different styles. Um, I think, frankly, I think he resented the fact that there was somebody in the market who was coming up and was making a name for himself. And I never wanted to compete with him. I, you know, I, he was the king. I mean, you know, I'm like a, a, a to him. And, and you were from Cleveland. And, well, I think I've been forgiven for that. <laughs> maybe, um, maybe at the time. Who knows? It's hard to tell because these people, the loyalties are amazing in this rivalry. But well, uh, it, that 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 ended. Um, that kind of ended when I went to twelve fifty because that was the Steelers station. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when I started doing the Steeler games on TV with Jack Cam, then you know, all of a sudden, I was okay. Okay. Um, but I, I and again, I you know, I think Myron resented the fact that. I was getting the attention that I did. But again, he was the king. And I never yeah. denied that. I never yeah. debated that. Um, this is probably a bit before your time. But when I was at um, 970, Double Double, um, one of the salespeople there, we invented, remember, Myron had the coconut. Well, we invented something called the Stanley Cup. It was a coffee mug. And it had a caricature of my face. And it said WWSW 970, the Stanley Cup. And I would award it to really good callers. 
and we'd send them out. I still have a couple. Um, and and uh, Myron, I know, made fun of that on the air. And I'm just, I was a young guy trying to make my way. Um, we got along. Don't get me wrong. There were not crosswords or anything like that. Um, and I think he respected me, but that's as far as it went. That's great stuff. If you are listening from Australia, Florida, or just from around the corner. From East Coast to West Coast outlets, if you're not to the dirty South straight, make a left and body, body. Contact us. Leave your mark with your host, Vince Cortez. So I want, I want to review here. So you'd been in Pittsburgh then since 75. Is that 76. correct? 76. I actually started so on the air. And I started got... on the air the day after Super Bowl X, which is a hard day to start because the whole town is going crazy. Their second Super Bowl. I spent the night, and I started broadcasting the next morning. I had to catch up to speed. Oh, wow. That they was put actually me up very in the exciting. Old, yeah, it was. Um, they put me up in the old Carlton Hotel, which is now a tea stop at the corner of, of Grant and, and, what is that, 7th. And um, they put me up there. And, of course, Steelers win. They beat Dallas, right? And... Fans are out partying all night long, throwing beer cans against the hotel wall. I'm nervous anyway. I'm up all night. I didn't sleep a wink. Um, <laughs> and I, I drove to Allegheny Center, and that was my first day on the air. So my first day on the air was January 19, 1976, the day after they won Super Bowl X. So you see then all four Super Bowls. You don't, the only well, one you miss is the 70, or no, you get the 71 or World Series is you miss, you got 79. But you I, saw... I was here for, I, I, I was, I was here for um, five of the six Super Bowl wins. I was here for the 79 World Series and all five, thank goodness, all five Stanley Cups. Now, that leads me to uh, a, a few questions. I'm going to kind of give you a couple of rapid-fire questions here. So what would you say was your biggest moment in your broadcasting career? Oh, not getting fired. That'd be one thing. That's <laughs> happened a few times. <laughs> I, I, um, it's, it's, That's kind of hard because you got quite a... a, a a number of things to choose from. Well, I, well I'll say this. It sounds like the first one, your experience there in your first day. Sounds like. It yeah. Was... I mean, I didn't, I, I was so caught up in the emotion of it, you know, getting settled um, and wanting to do well in the major market. It was a big step in my career, Pittsburgh. By the way, I should mention three months later, after being in Pittsburgh for three months, I got a call from a radio station in Detroit, big station there. And I had applied there. The guy they hired did not work out. And they said, we'd like you to come to Detroit. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that to my employers. They trusted me. I, I'm not going to do that to them after I'm here only three months. Um, so a rare show of integrity on my part. Uh, <laughs> it worked out for your benefit, though. It did. It, it, it just couldn't have gone any better, Vince. I, yeah. I, you know, I did so many events. Um, um the 2013 playoff game against the Reds, the Johnny Cueto game. Okay. Um, I was in Minnesota in 91 when they won the first cup. And I remember standing at where the Zamboni comes out and they, and I was supposed to do a live. It was a Saturday night, May 25th, 1991. And I was supposed to do a live report at 11 o'clock uh, on channel four. But I said, I've waited a long time. I want to see 66 skate with that cup. And I yes. waited and I waited and I waited and finally got the cup and he skated around and I was standing on the edge of the ice. And as he went by me, he winked at me and smiled. That was, that was such a thrill. Oh my goodness. You can't even imagine. I interviewed him later on that night. That was fantastic. Being at Joe Lewis arena when they won in 09, um, I was one of the few people who predicted they would win game seven. I just had a feeling. And there's another story about Sidney Crosby and Billy Guerin. It's, it's probably too long and convoluted. But going into the, the Penguins dressing room after they won that cup, um, and I, they drenched me, and I was more involved. <laughs> I was there every day, as I was in 91, too. But they drenched me with champagne from the cup and dumped it over me. 
I swore I would never get that suit dry clean. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I think I did. But as I was going through the locker room shaking hands, because I knew all of them pretty darn yeah. well. Um, as I was walking through the room, here comes Sydney, and he walks up to me and just gives me a giant bear hug. And he held on to me for a long time. And I said to him, I said, you made a lot of people very happy. That was a, a you know, a, a real thrill. Wow. Um, you know, all the Super Bowls and, you know, and, and not only being a reporter, but actually developing friendships uh, with the players like Mike Webster, who is a good friend. Um, Dwight White was a good friend. So many of them who I see today, uh, I'm so honored to be selected by Art Rooney to be um, a member of the Steelers Hall of Honor Selection Committee, maybe as a tribute to all the years I've covered them. Uh, and, and I'd be remiss, Vince, if I didn't mention, I felt like I had a special relationship with the Chief. Right. And I know everybody who ever met Art Rooney Sr. thought that they were his best friend because he made you feel like that. But I, I, I really did... Um, uh, one time was my birthday. They threw a surprise party for me. And Joe Gordon, the PR guy for the Steelers, Mr. Rooney was in Ireland. And they had the party at Pole Eyes Restaurant in Squirrel Hill, which isn't there anymore. And I was at the party, surprise party. I didn't know what was happening. And somebody came and said, there's a phone call for you. I don't know, a phone call? What are you talking about? Surprise party. It was Mr. Rooney calling from Ireland to wish me a happy birthday. And one other quick wow. story, my dad and my youngest sister, my mother had passed away by then. They drove over from Cleveland to see the Brown Steelers game and I got them tickets. We're walking into the media gate at Three Rivers and I was showing them where to go to get to their seats. I was gonna take the press elevator up. At the very same time, here comes the chief walking out a door to get ready to go up on the elevator as well. I said, oh, Mr. Chief, I said, I'd like you to meet my dad. And my father, Cleveland fan or not, was just in awe that he was about to meet Art Rooney. Wow. He respected him so much. And Mr. Rooney, this is my father. And Mr. Rooney said, Mr. Saverin, you got a good son here. And I... <laughs> I had to turn it away. Wow. I just lost it. I'm losing it now. Wow. That he said it. And my father, in his dying day, would always bring that story up. Oh, wow. So highlights. I mean, it, I, you I got a lot it had of them. to do with sports, but. Now, that's, that's what makes the whole thing go around right there. Yep. All right. I have a couple other ones. These won't. <clears throat> this is going to. Uh, this will be a little tougher on you. First of the teams that you broadcast games, which team was your favorite? Well, um, boy, oh boy. I did more Steelers work than any of the others. I never really did a play-by-play -play on a Pirates game, although I was very involved with them, pregame shows, postgame shows, that sort of thing, um, various shows. Uh, but I did five years of the preseason games on Channel 4 with Jack Ham. Um, I've been involved on the Steelers, and I did some play-by-play -play on the radio network for the Steelers. Well, as I mentioned, when Fleming was sick, and actually I was up for the job to replace Jack Fleming when they let him go, but right about that time, I got fired at Channel 4 and TAE Radio. I had it in my contract that I would be next in line. So I, not Bill, would have been the next voice of the Steelers on radio. Oh, wow. um, but I, you know, I've been on the post game show for years. I've been involved in the Steelers broadcast. I did three years of color on Penguins TV on KBL, whatever it was called back in those days, Fox, <laughs> whatever we were. So I did that and very active, but I would say if you're asking, I mean, I guess it depends on what time of year you ask my favorite sport is. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really love them all. I knew that was going to be a tough one for you to answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say pro football is my favorite. 
But I have to say that my favorite team, by a slight margin, might be the Penguins. Okay. Wow. Always... Wow. After all that, I thought it was the Steelers for sure. Okay, it's now, close. Mark, I'm not going to make this any easier on you. This is the worst question. All your years of broadcasting, who was your favorite player? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, I mentioned Mike Webster. Um, and all of, I had a very good relationship. This is a tough Terry, one. This, yeah. This is not easy. Terry Bradshaw. I had a really good relationship with Terry. Uh, we always, just always got along. I mentioned Dwight White. Um, you have to remember when I was covering the Steelers, I was their age. We were the same age. Yeah. yeah. When I walk into the Steelers locker room now, players probably say, who's that grandpa guy? <laughs> and I, you know, that's true of all the sports. Um, Mario has always been very, very good to me. Uh, when I had my open heart bypass surgery, I think I told you it was pretty severe. I'm in the hospital. I'm in Shadyside hospital. Maybe four days after the procedure. Um, I don't have to tell you, it's it's not easy. No. And the phone rings in my room, and I answer, and he said, Stan? I said, yes. He said, this is Mary Olamieux. Mary Olamieux called me in the hospital to see how I was doing. And Honestly. whenever I would see him after I got out, when I kind of got back on my feet, if I would see him across the room at the arena or whatever, he would always look at me, he would tap his heart with his right hand and then go, are you okay? Is your heart okay? And I would give him the thumbs up. The mere fact that he thought to do that. Um, Phil Garner was always Jim Rooker from the 79 team. I ended up having a very good relationship with Willie Stargell after he left Over Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, uh, I haven't answered your question. Kevin I don't Stevens. think that, that was a fair question, actually. <laughs> it is. Kevin <laughs> Stevens and I, to this day, um, have a great... He, he was fantastic. Wow. He's Kevin unbelievable. Stevens. Wow. He's Big a Artie. monster. I saw right. him a couple of years ago when he came to town. So, All right. I don't know. I, I think I'll give you a pass on that one. You actually right. answered it fairly well. I thought I was like, I don't know. He's not going to be able to answer this one. I don't think he's going to. All right, so what I want to touch on now is um, you mentioned it there you had a heart surgery. So you had a pretty extensive uh, health issue where you had as many as eight bypasses? Yeah, I've had a few health issues. I've had um, the open-heart bypass surgery, which was 12 years ago. Um, it all went great. I'm fine. I'm in the best shape of my life, even when I was playing football and everything. Um, I've had two brain tumors removed. Um, they were benign. Um, I've had four surgeries on my back. I've had, I think, six surgeries for various issues in my feet. Um, that's enough. I'm doing okay. That's good. I'm a you, stubborn. No, I, you're, a, you're a warrior. You're, I'm they a, don't yeah, make it like you anymore. <laughs> well, uh, somebody said one of the favorite things after, I mean, Mike Tomlin knew about all my surgeries. And I used to co host his show, co host his show. And after the second of the brain tumors, I came in, I had stitches in my forehead. And he, you know, he, this was after the heart surgery and after the four back surgeries. And he looked at me and he said, You are a tough son of a bitch. And to get that from the head coach of an NFL team, I just said to myself, God, take me now. I, you know, I'm fine. That's I'll go die happy right now. I'll die happy right now. True story. Oh, that's beautiful. If you have a story to share, tell us. How are you going to leave your mark? Leave your mark. Contact us. Leave your mark with our host, Vince Cortez. Be our guest. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get close here. We're almost finished. When you started your journey in broadcasting, what were you expecting was going to happen? Or what kind of a career did you think was going to play out? My first thought was that I'm going to get to do something that I love. And I didn't know anything about broadcasting. I'll be honest with you. I didn't even know that broadcast entities made money by selling commercials. Wow. I didn't. 
the education at, in radio and TV broadcasting back in the late 60s, it, it, it wasn't very good. It was a great university, don't get me wrong, but they, they developed people that go into uh, PBS and, and, you know, and educational TV. I was the only guy in Miami who wanted to be on the air. And I did not know until I was a senior when I got that job doing high school play-by-play -play basketball, make sure you get the commercials in. And I thought to myself, well, why? Uh, that was, how dumb am, am I? But um, to answer your question, um, once I got into it, I realized that my avocation was becoming my vocation. And how many people can say that? My mom once said to me, she came to Pittsburgh for a pirate game, and she waited for me outside the pirate locker room while I was doing interviews and stuff. We watched the game together, and then I, I went and did my job. We were driving back to my apartment in the North Hills then, and she said, do you ever stop and think how lucky you are? How many people would trade places with you? And I think I realized it. Um, as far as career goals, um, I wanted to be a network announcer. I wanted to be Dick Enberg. Wow. I wanted to be Kurt Gowdy. Um, Kurt Gowdy. I loved Kurt Gowdy. Yep. And I think Dick Enberg was the best of all he time. He was my favorite, Dick Enberg. Um, and I wanted to be a national guy. And I thought I had the talent for it. Um, I had a lot of people in the industry say, you can do this, but there's so much involved. You know, you need a break. Um, I learned subsequent to my dismissal at Channel 4 um, that ABC was going to hire me to do regional college football on Saturday afternoon. Not the big game like Keith Jackson did, but, you know, some of the regionals. And the guy who ran Channel 4, who fired me from there, called ABC and put the kibosh on it. Bino Cook told me that, who was working at ABC. So who knows what might have happened. But in all honesty, Vince, it didn't. I have no regrets, none whatsoever. I, 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 I would have liked to have proved that I could be that. Um, I think I could have done a national talk show. You know, I don't know what I'm good at, but that is one of the things that I'm good at. Then that, that leads me to the final question of leave your mark, and that is how would you like to leave your mark? How would you like well, to Well, I'd like to leave it indelibly, and I'd like to leave it for a few years longer both the broadcaster and on the earth, um, I, I would like to get the 30 years at AT&T Sportsnet. I'd like to broadcast 50 years in Pittsburgh. I got a few years to go. Um, well, you have an anniversary of something going on right now too, don't you? Well, uh, a couple of weeks ago in mid-June, I celebrated my 29th anniversary at various iterations of what is now AT&T Sportsnet. It began, I joined there in June, actually March of 1992. Um, uh, we began with Sports Beat and, you know, all those things and Hockey Hotline, Talking Bucks and what, what they're doing now. They're kind of moving me out. I mean, I understand that, but um, I, I guess my, my, I think that my greatest achievement, if, it, if you want to call it that, my legacy will be Sports Beat. I, I think because me and Guy, Junker, it was unique at the time. No, no one had ever done that. Um, it was a sports talk radio show on TV. It was unique. Yeah. And it started out on a shoestring. I can't tell you how many times the boss would come and say, well, you know, we're running out of money. You know, it might not be here next week. That's true. We, we, we honestly didn't know from week to week. That's a lot of and, pressure. And to have established that, to how popular it became. And the show's now been off the air for 12 years, and still people refer to it. They say, love the show. Stan, Guy, first off, love the show. People talk about sports beat. To me, that'll be my greatest legacy. And the other part of that is, I'm, I'm so proud of that, that Guy and I persevered um, and kept that on the air. And it's part of, I think, part of, it was on the air for 18 years. It was on the air longer than Gunsmoke was on the air. So I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really proud. It was on longer than Bowling for Dollars with Nick Perry. Wow, no, that's I, big, I, Bowling I, for Dollars. Yeah, I'm proud of that. And the other thing is, um, I would like to be remembered as a guy 
who worked hard every day, every hour, never sh took a shortcut, um, was honest and fair and accurate, most of the time anyway, I tried to be. <laughs> and um, that I hope that I earned the respect of the Pittsburgh sports fan. Oh, That's I'm enough for me. That. I believe you did that. I, I, the same as you mentioned um, is growing up with the Steelers. I grew up with you. And I was so thrilled to have you on and, and find out that we would have an opportunity to have you on. So I appreciate you being here more than words can say. You're great. I knew you were going to be good. So continue Thank your you. success, Dan. I mean, I, I want to see you get to 50 years because you've left quite a trail for others in your line of work to follow. So kudos to you. Stay healthy. And uh, I want I want to get any of your links or any of uh, what your current work is on here when we post this, so that the viewing audience can see all of what you're up to and see all of what you've accomplished. And it's just amazing. You have Pittsburgh sports legend. Well, thank you. Uh, I really am flattered that you asked me. Um, I, I really am. I truly am. Um, uh, I've never been afraid to tell the bare honest truth about myself, not just sports, but about myself. I think one of the reasons I've lasted this long is that people know I've been honest with them and that I'm open, that I'm approachable, and that the guy they hear on radio or the guy they see on TV is the same guy that they meet at the grocery store. People say, your voice sounds the same. <laughs> and they meet the person, and I say, I only have one. And they, and they say, you're taller than we thought you were, and you're not as fat as we thought you were. So uh, I, the fact that the fact they feel comfortable coming up to me, whether it's at Latrobe or at the Giant Eagle, whatever it happens to be. That's great. So, That's uh, great. Yeah, thank you're you. Perfect match for Pittsburgh. You were a perfect match. Well, someone once said to me, you're a real Pittsburgh guy. Yep. To me, that's the ultimate confidence. Yep, confidence. I agree. Well, take care, Stan, and be blessed. Thank you, Vince. Stay healthy. You as well. You just left your mark. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Listen to more episodes on demand. Just click Leave Your Mark with Vince Cortez. <laughs>